Okay, thank you so much for joining us here today for the Sodomite Invasion Book Launch. The Sodomite Invasion Exhibition, Publication, and Residency were supported with funding from the Canada Council, BC Arts Council, and North Vancouver Recreation and Culture. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Stolo Nations. We are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. My name is Fauni Barra, and I am the Public Programming and Residency Coordinator here at Griffin Art Projects. I have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. So if you would like to see the live transcription, the live captions displayed for today's presentations, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen as well. If you're experiencing any technical issues with the Zoom interface, we're also live streaming today's event on Griffin Art Project's Facebook page, so you can watch from there too. As you know, we're using Zoom's webinar format today, which means we cannot hear you or see you. However, we can read you. So please feel free to get in touch using the chat dialog box at the bottom of your screen. There will also be a chance that today at the end of today's conversation for the audience questions. So if at any point throughout the presentation, you have a question for our presenters, feel free to type it in the Q&A dialog box also at the bottom of your screen. As a special celebration of the book for the next week, we have a special offer for all attendees. If you would like to purchase the book, we would like to offer you a 10% discount and free shipping. Um, I'm putting the, in the chat box the form you can fill out to request a copy. There you go. So the Sodomite Invasion, Experimentation, Politics, and Sexuality in the Work of Jimmy DeSana and Marlon P. Riggs documents the exhibition of the same name curated by Lorenzo Fusi within Griffin's ethic, Ethics of Care Framework in 2020. Written during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, the publication offers unique insight on the life and work of Desana and Briggs, and features original research and material, as well as long-form interview with Briggs, repeated with permission. The publication also creates a space to revisit the cultural, artistic, and activist relations between Canada and the U.S. at the apex of the HIV and AIDS crisis in the 1980s and onward. We would like to thank Amanda Wilkinson, Laurie Simmons, Lyle Ashton Harris, Robert Reed Park, Julian Lesage, Vivian Clement, Signifying Words, Framework Distribution, California Newsreel, and Vivo Media Arts Center for letting us use the image for letting us use their images in the book. Now I'll introduce guest editor and curator Lorenzo Fusi. Lorenzo Fusi is the artistic director and curator at the Jerry Van Biennial. He was the artistic director of Briggs International DR Contemporary of the Foundation Prince Pierre de Monaco in, from 2014 to 2020, and the visiting academic curator at the Alberta University of the Arts, where he directed the Ill World Care Gallery between 2016 and 2018. Previously, he was the director of the Open Eye Gallery, one of the oldest not-for-profit photography galleries in the UK. Prior to this appointment, Fusi was the international curator at the Liverpool Biennial, for which he curated the 2010 and 2012 renditions titled Touch and the Unexpected Guest, respectively. Between 2001 and 2009, he was the chief curator at Palazzo della Papese Contemporary Art Center, who then became the contemporary art curator of the Santa Maria della Scala Museum Hub in Siena. Fusi regularly lectures at university and has a portfolio of around 100 curated exhibition projects and as many publications and almost 200 commissions. Now, Lisa Baldissera, the curator of Griffin, uh, has held curatorial roles in public art galleries in Western Canada since 1999, where she was produced more than 50 exhibitions of local Canadian and international artists. She holds MFAs in creative writing, from UBC and Art in the University of Saskatchewan and a PhD of the Goldsmiths College, University of London. Valdisera has served on contemporary art juries across Canada and internationally, including the Alvin Balkin Curators Prize, the Doris and Jack Shalwood Foundation, Canada Council for the Arts, Saskatchewan's Art Arts Board, Royal Bank of Canada Canadian Painting Competition, 
the Hastings Foundation Visual Arts Awards, the Sobe Art Award, British Columbia Arts Council, Prince, Prince de Monaco Jury, and as a guest of the British Arts Council Outreach Team. I'll leave you with briefing our project's director, Lisa Valdezera, and guest editor and curator, Lorenzo Fusi. Thank you so much, Fauna. And welcome, Lorenzo. Thank you so much for fitting us into your very busy traveling schedule and um, all of the things that you juggle so gracefully with all of your cur curatorial projects. Um, such a delight to have you here. I think you might be on mute right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation and, and thank you for organizing this book launch remotely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. And um, I, you know, it's been such a process, of course, the exhibition, the Sodomite Invasion, um, Experimentation, Politics and Sexuality in the work of Jimmy DeSanna and Marlon T. Riggs uh, was your brainchild conceived in 2019, which you um, uh, extended by research in Vancouver um, and such important research too to kind of open up a new sort of um, avenue of how Vancouver imagines itself and its histories and also mm. how these two important figures actually had connections to Canadian um, artists and curators so you know such an important part of this book so first of all congratulations on all of this work and um, all of this new research, which I think is so incredibly um, essential in reviewing it again this morning and looking through and seeing all of the connections that are newly made to these historical figures through this book. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity because truly it wouldn't come along or, or at least not in the way that it did without the opportunity and without the residency, which was really the starting point for, for, for us to initiated dialogue and then for me just to to try to to understand what i wanted to do and what i wanted to make of this residency opportunity because we we, we know like you know we offer artists on a regular basis opportunities for residencies you know el everywhere in the world and and the output or the outcome of these experiences is, is often it's very hard to phantom you know sometimes it's only thinking time sometimes it's production time sometimes it's the delivery of something that you've been elaborating for a longer period of time and then you know ultimately you have an opportunity to 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 digest it and to elaborate and then to present it publicly so you know it's for me it was it was very interesting how the point of your invitation i was already looking separately at the work of jimmy desana and marlon t riggs um, for similar and different reasons and and completely coincidentally Vancouver and the residency at the Griffin happened to become the opportunity to not only to connect locally the experience of these two artists but also to connect within my brain the many relationships which I haven't made as yet as visible to myself uh, between their work between their life experiences between their struggles and most importantly, I think in relationship to what you were developing at the time, um, in relationship to ideas of care, because I think that's probably where the exhibition and consequently the book, they took form. The idea that, that there have been people who took care of both Marlon's uh, and Jimmy's uh, legacy, uh, during the lifetime as well as through their passing and into today and the the beauty of those act of care I think is really what not only resonated with me at the time but is really what it made ultimately everything possible I became more like a conduit or in a sense both the Griffin and myself we became the conduit uh, and the conducer for something that has happened through act of love and care that somebody else had performed, namely uh, Laurie Simon and Vivian uh, Kleinman with the entire board of a trust uh, who's supporting and keeping alive a legacy of Marlon T. Riggs. So these two women, realistically, they really are the reason uh, why everything happened or it became possible at some, at some point. So I think that's very important to acknowledge the, the, the presence of these two carers, in fact, um, into a story which is rich with beauty and poetry and 
um, and 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 activism and 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 bravery and courage, but ultimately uh, uh, also really heavily marked by by death and loss and 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 um, uh, an incredible sadness uh, as well. Yeah, and absolutely, your you know acknowledgement of these two because as we know without that care it's so easy for a legacy to go missing and to also have done that over decades you know this is mm -hmm. the 90s so um and i know you talked about in the book Lori's um her kind of further care and not wanting to sort of weigh in and and create the books that jimmy with the book salvation where um jimmy was sort of leaving that with her to kind of make final decisions yeah. about and then she it, it basically um you know through her grief initially but then you know not trusting her recall and and the complexity of the decisions decided to leave the work as salvation which was um shown in the exhibition and then mm -hmm. um also shown with um 101 portraits which he did in his 20s which is amazing you know as a and there's a really interesting parody in the in those two pieces almost the way that they bookend um you know his history and the fact that he goes to these sequential um, yeah i mean it's i i i mean obviously it's always very difficult to speak about something that you have yourself curated because you always look like you know you're basically self-congratulating which uh, i'm not i think what in in relationship i mean there are two things that i would like to say in relationship to what you just say first of all i think this incredible parallelism between Marlon and Jimmy, in particular in relationship to their final work or to their unfinished work, because um, I think they have very different personalities, but they had very similar agendas, particularly at the end of their lives. So as both Marlon and Jimmy, they realized that they were very close to their end. Uh, Marlins was committed to accomplishing an incredible piece of work, which is Black is Black end and um the film was literally like you know was both uh filmed and edited as uh it was really getting severely healed and all of his friends all of his collaborators long time collaborators they realized that this was his final um uh, his final piece and he himself uh, uh who is recorded speaking from his hospital bed understand that this is probably his last piece and he puts all of the energies and notwithstanding that he didn't see the film being um, released and it was only thanks to the participation and the collaboration of his friends that the film eventually uh, was presented publicly and accomplished and similarly jimmy realized that it was in you know in a similar uh, point where the progression of by then aids had been such that uh, it was basically talking uh, thinking uh, uh, about his legacy piece uh, which uh, interestingly enough he titled salvation so it was really like in his way to in a sense to redeem himself or just to pass on his own legacy to the future generations through a final act which was a conscious act of self-salvation in a sense and i don't know whether like you know he thought about salvation as in a, a religious sense or uh as in a way to uh to to preserve his legacy in a way that it was self-directed in that sense to self-preserving himself and his own work through this final act which was a book that he discussed extensively with Laurie Simmons who at the time was probably the closest friend but also as an artist and, a, and as a photographer could be probably even the person who could understand and have the sensibility to finish the work according to his notes and to his uh, uh, will. And when Laurie showed me the booklet, it was basically you know, a, a mock-up of a book with all of the handwritten notes of the time sticked you know, next to the pages. And the pages that were really going in the, you know, in the correct sequence or the sequence they wanted. But of course, you know, I can only imagine how incredibly emotional she must have been at that moment in time and probably not fully focusing on the book itself, but rather in how to 
you know, to, to, to deal with the imminent loss. I think that's really, and also probably with more pragmatic things such as like, you know, what to do with these negatives, with these photographs, with these stuff, you know, with everything that a person is about to leave behind. And so I can fully comprehend how she would have been somehow distracted, although she wanted to pay full attention to, to what they were discussing. And she, she, I think she was kind of overwhelmed by so many different things, including, as I said, the loss that she left the task of completing and publishing the book to too late, uh, to a point in which she had already forgotten somehow the conversation of probably she had removed herself from that moment in time and you know we we all try to self-preserve ourselves in this kind of circumstances and quite often i can i can surely speak for myself sometimes you really want to forget rather than to remember particularly very painful moments so i wonder whether that moment is something that she unconsciously wanted to forget more than to remember because it was obviously the moment in time in which uh, Jimmy was the most vulnerable. And I think, unlike Marlon's work, Jimmy was uber personal as a photographer, as an artist who was mostly doing everything himself, other than asking the models to, to collaborate. He was doing his own lighting, he was doing his own printing. He was a very self-sufficient and independent artist. And Marlon, Conversely, as a filmmaker and as a documentarist, he knew they could not do what he wanted without the support and the help of many other people. So I think to a degree he was able to coordinate the work, his final work, in a way that Jimmy couldn't, because Jimmy was really self-reliant in a sense. He was really depending on himself, as opposed to Marden, who knew that there were many other people involved in throughout the process, and he had more opportunities to delegate and to share the difficult task to accomplish such a, uh, such a masterpiece at such a, a critical time. So I think these two final works, they speak of the similarities as well of the differences between Marlon Riggs and Jimmy DeSanna, and particularly of the dif differences between someone like Marlon, who is really well versed with large publics, with the media, uh, very um, extrovert, very vocal, incredibly eloquent, uh, as opposed to Jimmy, who is was notoriously super shy, not a big speaker, uh, not a public speaker at all, to the point that, especially when he was younger, he was passing himself as a, as a mute and, uh, and kind of operating like a sort of a Buster Keaton type of character yeah. in the demi monde of a time. And so we're talking about two personalities that they couldn't be more different, but they happen to undergo a very similar process around the same time. So as Jimmy died in for AIDS related complications in 1990, uh, Marlon survived him of four years. So he died in 1994 and it's kind of double, I mean, double is the pain of thinking that exactly around 1994, the first successful experiment with antiretroviral that were happening. And if only the two of them would have survived a few more years through the agony of what it was HIV AIDS at the time, probably would we would have had both of them with us today. You know, it's, uh, they could have been amongst the first survivors of what in, effectively was, um, a death sentence at the time. And so it's, I think that the, the book is, as well as the exhibition, was also an homage and a tribute to someone who could have made it actually, because uh, uh, they were not amongst the, the victims. They were actually amongst you know, the later victims, although they contracted the, the virus during the eighties when still very little could be done other than SAT. Um, but particularly Marlon was really not far from where a possibility, a hope uh, was developed. And that breaks my heart every time I think about it. Like, you know, how much quality, talent, intelligence, uh, poetry, um, beauty we have lost for, you know, sometimes for a matter of months, if not, you know, uh, a year or two. And so in a sense, this entire project is really is a tribute to anyone obviously we lost at the time and many many other authorial voices that you know would be unfortunately too long the list to to name all of them right now but in a way i think i really wanted to to 
to memorialize the work and the example of people who, although they were very different, happened to be living the same tragedy and to fight that tragedy through the work and through their social uh, uh, presence and political activism. And I think that's really what the, 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 both the book as well as the exhibitions are about. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the exhibition opened in January, 2020. And um, as we know, the pandemic, uh, or our pandemic of, of mm. in the last two years, the newest pandemic um, has shaped, you know, the last two years of life. And of course, none of us could have known that as your exhibition was open. Oh, no, of course. Yeah, you know, I think, so, yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting that, you know, that, that, I couldn't stop thinking exactly as we were like, you know, thinking about uh, publishing the book and I was like, you know, progressing with the writing and having conversation with you remotely and understanding how uh, uh, the, the, the tragic impact that the pandemic had on our exhibition and the public program that we had planned and everything else. But the thing that immediately came to mind was the difference between these two pandemics was and is in connection to stigma because hardly uh you know as soon as we realized that the pandemic was a pandemic and it was really you know affecting everyone people from any social class any gender any sexual orientation any provenance although obviously there has been a very strong anti-asian um uh, uh, sentiment initially because obviously china was blamed to be the uh, the cause of all problems and to have willingly, basically, you know, um, produced uh, and uh, distributed the pandemic to damage other economies or other uh, uh, political systems, it became pretty soon clear that this was affecting everyone and all of us. And now I think, particularly during the first lockdown, I mean, obviously, we all have lived it in different ways, but I think what it became quite evident was a sense of solidarity and a mutual understanding. Um, that it didn't occur during the HIV and AIDS pandemic. And I think the level of stigma and the ferocity with which society has been attacked, people who were already incredibly vulnerable and scared and already subjected to other forms of violence, particularly those who were uh, you know, dealing with drug addictions or who were discriminated based on their gender or sexual orientation already, on top of that, they had to undergo at the most critical time, you know, all of the stigma and all of the ferocity and all of the attacks, public attacks of both, you know, polit politicians as well as the public opinion. And I think for that, we will never be forgiven, nor forgotten. I mean, our generation, I think, should con constantly remember what we have done to these victims of a different pandemic, which was since the outset uh, associated with a, a, a social disease as more than uh, a medical disease yeah. as such. And David Wynarich's Wynar favorite famous quote yeah. about that, you know, where he recognized that um, when he received his diagnosis, he was part of a social, it was part of yeah. a social disease. So, exactly. You know, um, I mean, it's really when we think about this kind of this moment and how it talks to this abdication, that kind of abandonment of collective care and the kind of willfulness of that abandonment, um, you know, and then the model of, you know, sort of racing toward a, a solution, a vaccination, you know, and how many things were mobilized, um, which were had to be so actively um, for years and years mitigated against, you know, so that these political figures, like even, you know, Anthony Fauci was part of that initial movement and part of the resistance and the target of that resistance initially when he didn't, when he didn't act fast enough mm -hmm. during the AIDS pandemic. So it's really interesting to see that these figures reemerging. Um, and Fauci talked about, you know, having learned, you know, somewhat during that during the AIDS crisis about this, these shortfalls, but certainly, you know, we can see it recirculating again, that they're, they're, um, that it's not gone away as a, as a structure. And so this is yeah. so, so important, the work that you did here, um, you know, and 
I mean, we can talk about all the other things that happened during the pandemic and have happened. It's been the seismic two years on every level from the mm -hmm. democracy to um, these kind of autocratic political movements taking rights away. Once again, we sort of have heard over the last few weeks even, you know, um, what that very, um, uh, you know, the, the movements of the Supreme Court um, and yeah. all that. Yeah. Um, begin to remind us in, in what was sort of, you know, supposed to be the celebrated liberal democracy and what it does to that, to a global understanding. Yeah, I think there's something very interesting that you, you correctly pointed out, I think is the, um, the relation between uh, medical care and pandemics in this case, a moment of like, you know, medical crisis uh, on a global scale and its relationship to ideas of morality, I think is very interesting. And also how in a time of crisis, in this case, in a time of a pandemic, and uh, there's not only a witch hunt system, which you know happened during the AIDS uh, crisis and has happened most recently with the COVID pandemic, but also this kind of, um, it's almost become an opportunity for increasing the polarization of society and political polarization and to get into extremes and to forms of hysteria and irrationality, uh, which I think was very evident at some point during the, the recent pandemic. This kind of moment of like, you know, we up, you know, we, you were listening to all of the most bizarre stories and, you know, people being injected with a vaccine, also inoculated, whatever, like, you know, trans uh, microchip, so whatever else, you know, they wanted to, to, to believe. And all of that, in a sense, um, seems to be confirming that a moment of hysteria, uh, ignorance and prejudice um, revamp. And so in that sense, I think I've seen many similarities. On the other hand, as I said, I've seen a sort of a selective solidarity as well which was interesting. Um, but I've also seen kind of form of resurgence of political self-organizing, which has happened during the recent pandemic. I mean, if you think about how the Black, Life, Black Lives Matters movement has been reignited, unfortunately because of serious events, but also like, you know, despite this impossibility to, to come together and to walk down the street in support of uh, causes that we believe are important. It happened nevertheless. And I think even during the AIDS crisis, although the stigma, the, 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 the desire to, for society to vanish these people and to vanish the issue, uh, people that came to the street and they came to demonstrate and despite um, their um, vulnerability and their um, their fear and uh, terror actually they managed to to walk down the street and to demonstrate for themselves and for the others and so th there have been some interesting um, correlations and i think the two extremes came about they came you know the idea of extreme right-wing conservatorism emerged but at the same time, there's also this kind of counterpart, this backlash with this idea of like, you know, walking down the street in solidarity, notwithstanding everything uh, as occurred in both instances. And I think that's what it gives me hope. And that's also where coincidentally, particularly the work of modern TRX became so important because obviously the idea to, to talk about sexuality, sexuality in health, and in disease, uh, but in uh, at the intersection with race and with the issues of uh, race, particularly in, in North America, uh, um, somehow it became even more incredibly relevant during the time, uh, the recent times, uh, and and all of a sudden, like you know, I, I had the opportunity to to reevaluate even more how incredibly contemporary the work by Marlon is. Um, as well as the one by Jimmy, but Jimmy's work, well, first of all, by being static as opposed to be like, you know, filmic or documentary in nature is obviously more poetic and more lyrical and more humorous, but it has a different kind of way of communicating. And I think even the way in which we can say that, that his work is, 
political is very different from obviously uh, the documentary nature of a work by Barry Marlin, but particularly obviously at the intersection of race and, and, and the appropriation of thinking about how um, differences and divergences in America had been formed historically through times in a very accurate, very illustrative, very um, deep analysis. Um, which starts from you know from the formation of a country to the present. I think all of that is still uh, super important. I mean, I'm surprised that there's no more talk about Marlon T. Riggs, to be honest, in contemporary society. You know, it's interesting in reading the interview that you um, just to sort of describe for our audience who maybe hasn't seen the book yet, but the book is an incredible kind of look through time. So you have reprinted interviews with Chuck Kleinhaus. Uh, with um, from 1989 um, and in discussion with Marlon as well as these new interviews with Robert Reedfire and then also with Jimmy D. Sanna's um, uh, partner and collaborator Robert Stefanotti in the book which and so you've, you've got this combination of going backwards and forwards through time mm -hmm. which, you know really I think speaks to what we're talking about this odd moment you know um, I might refer to a Stan Douglas quote, which is that, um, you know, history does not repeat itself, but, you know, really the moment contains all the moments that have gone before critically. Mm. And I think what you've done in this book is actually, is actually point to that in, in your editorial um, choices. And I also think about in your interview with Robert Reed Farr, you he talks about his concern for the revolutionary impulse and a kind of renewed need for it and how um, Marlon was such a revolutionary and how he worked and you know his questioning about contemporary revolutionary um, action you know and his wish for perhaps more of it and I wonder if you might want to comment on that interview with Robert. Yeah I think one of the ongoing issues I mean that I think it belongs to my generation and to Robert's generation um, as well um, I think one of the strengths of the queer community for you know sake of simplification of was and to my eyes the idea to be a dissonant voice a voice that operates at the margin a voice that it goes in antagonism with uh, power structures because they've been historically ostracized by these power structures and demonized by them and so there was something revolutionary by default by becoming publicly a queer person, particularly a queer person of color, obviously. And um, I really had great expectation, uh, especially when I was a younger person. And, you know, we're looking basically in retrospect to what has happened since the 80s and through the 90s and through what I call a process of normalization of uh, queer eccentric forces. Um, which is also ultimately trivialization and commodification. And so nowadays, obviously, I'm delighted to see all sorts of people and all sorts of voices being represented everywhere from mainstream, you know, media um, and to occupy more and more powerful positions or position of visibility. At the same time, I'm wondering now that we have been normalized as a category and now that we are subjected to the same um, capitalist and hyper liberalist forces, where is room for antagonism and where uh, the tension and what Chantal Mouffe consider uh, a healthy uh, antagonism between political forces that should be enabling in the long term uh, democracy to survive as opposed to form of oligarchy or monopolies uh, of power. I wonder where that this antagonism reside right now. And I had hoped that uh, the LGBTQI plus, plus community could be a place where they could safeguard that space. Um, and now I see that there is less and less room in that space for uh, a real political alternative. And so, I think that one of the conversations with, that we had, it was like, it is true that 
it's exhausting to be always on the other side of a barricade and just to be the one who is you know continuously defending the kind of space of freedom but without that as we have re recently witnessed we're going to be losing every single right we have been conquering over time and so my call for action is and my call for diversity in that sense uh, is really to keep their diversity and by diversity seem, I'm, I'm talking holistically by like you know by being alternative by being outside of what is mainstream discourse because without that alternative um, I see uh, how you know ideas of democracy can be put at risk very quickly um, and can be silenced with uh, many forms of pacification we all know like you know that ultimately we all want good things and good life and good quality of life and money and status and whatever which ultimately becomes a way to silence all of these alternatives and so i don't want anyone to struggle physically or you know or economically but i think it's important for all of us to understand that if we want to enable alternative discourse happening we need to take the responsibility and also embrace the discomfort to be on the other side of a barricade. And I think both Marlon as well as Jimmy, to some degree, have done that, particularly Marlon, I think, uh, particularly in, in relationship and uh, with his um, double fight, which was the one to obviously uh, oppose any discrimination based on gender and sexuality, but also to emancipate the position of black communities and black society within uh, US society in particular, but globally uh, in general. And so all of that, I think, is very important to, to remember that it hasn't finished yet. You know, that fight hasn't finished yet. And that we are all uh, involved uh, in that still to this day. And to the point to have to take like, you know, sometimes position, uncomfortable position or defend uncomfortable positions. Um, in order to keep these ideals uh, alive and to pursue a better society, a more equal and just society. You know, it's interesting when in, in the interview with Chuck Kleinas um, that Marlon talks about sort of deliberately structuring that final film, um, Love is Love Eight, for, um, you know, for his, for a community that was um, was still a collective, like he talked about the fact that there was, you know, he, there's a trans figure, even though he didn't necessarily engage too much with trans culture, um, but he does have a really specific kind of um, embrace through that film of so many different perspectives that are um, crucial in kind of that, that collective work that is part of filmmaking, but the collective work that he perceived, whereas some of the earlier films like the film that was produced through the PBS, you know, mm. deliberately looking at, you know, sort of trying to find um, this kind of ground to speak to those who may or may not be supportive. And I thought that was so interesting that he um, he has this range, because it's not necessarily that he arrives at it, he just says, I can do both. I can do this work over here, and I can mm -hmm. also do this other work. Um, and I just thought that was quite revolutionary in a time of polarization, you know, that we're in right now, you know, for, for the model that he proposed there of sort of speaking into that. Yeah, I think his work is, for me, is, it, it was evolving. Like, you know, by the time he died, I think his work and his political consciousness was evolving. Um, and I think correctly so, because we, you know, none of us, uh, is born with like you know infused science we all learn as we go and I think the more inquisitive is your research the more the better you become as a researcher as well as a human being I think that Marlon had initially already a great intuition which was you know the first part of his work was you know strongly focusing on race uh, and the formation of ideas of blackness in 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 America as this was informed by white people and to contrast that and just to show that you know all of this stereotyping was wrong and it was banal and trivial and imprecise and one of the first thing that he does he says that look you're looking at us black people but we're as if we were one entity 
when in, in effect within the notion of blackness there's as many variety and differences as there are in any other group and so he used the metaphor of his grandmother gamba recipe as the idea that you know it becomes the juicier the nicer the more are the ingredients and the more odd these ingredients are amongst themselves just to say like you know, how beautiful and rich is the african-american community is not because it's the same but because it's so incredibly different and i think in his later work was coming to exactly the same conclusion thinking about queer communities where he started to understand that in order to reach a wider audience but also in order to have a stronger political impact through his work he had to embrace a much wider understanding of what being queer means or meant at the time including categories that they were not necessarily at the core of his work initially i think initially it was very much about self-identification it was very much looking at men who were looking like the people he would probably have had sex with or would have like you know some attraction to um, and not necessarily like you know looking at other uh, other categories and so i think it was really in that kind of journey to become more and more inclusive and more and more interested actually in ideas of diversity within diversity uh, and to explore much wider notions of it and if only would have had the time to get into you know a more um evolved thinking around you know these categories i think we would have probably witnessed some very interesting work that it's harder to imagine just only looking at the work at the beginning of his career and I think that's also reflective of society. Like, you know, we all know that particularly the presence of uh, transgender, I would say mostly transgender people had been neglected by the LGBTI community to start with, uh, let alone by the broader society. You know, they've been, their role has been not recognized in so many important campaigns, in, including Stonewalls, which was actually activated and made possible. Um, by uh by them and so it, it's interesting it's like you know the work is somehow aged in in that sense meaning that i think society of the discussion we're having in society has evolved and emancipated farther uh but it's also very much reflective of you know the, the moment in which it was created which is the beginning of the 90s where still quite a lot of conversation difficult conversation hadn't happened in full at least publicly um yet um, it's interesting too that with the current resistance to critical race theory, for, for example, in the states, that this this again comes back as this um, that they're you know that we can have both both uh, the, the, the criticality of diversity within diversity. This is an unfolding conversation, an exciting conversation that will you know continue to progress and then within this other superstructure of resistance within the mainstream of any discussion of difference mm. you know yep. is which becomes kind of um, you know shocking and at the same time you know means that the work i think of both um jimmy de and marlon riggs keeps coming back in terms of um just how incredibly uh, like the, the bravery and progressiveness of this work when it was happening mm -hmm. yeah keep unfolding you know yeah there was something if you just to go back to something that you asked before and i actually i didn't reply to that um which is about the interviewing format and how i utilized it in the in the book and I think I actually did it for two different reasons, because as I, as I was saying at the beginning of our conversation, I think Marlon's and Jimmy's personality, they were so incredibly different that the motives behind um, uh, uh, asking other people to, uh, to, to, to become part of this kind of choral narrative, it's quite opposite. Uh, in the case of Marlon, as I said, he was incredibly eloquent. Also, as a professor at the university, he was used to speak to students. He was used to speak to, to stakeholders, because obviously, in order to produce films, you know, you need a lot of people. You need to convince a lot of people. You need to have, like, you know, good kind of producer uh, ability to engage people and to describe your work and to, and to tell uh, people your needs. 
and so uh, also was an incredibly eloquent person. And I think it's not by chance that quite a lot of his fascination for particularly black and gay poetry is um, underpinning a lot of his visual work because he really loved words as much as he loved images and music and performance. Um, all of this to say that it, I had immediately this kind of feeling that the book had to have a part in which he was speaking. And I thought that the best way for for let him speak was in a sort of a dialogical format. So I retrieved this interview, which I think was quite little known because it was an interview taken in, in an oral form and then transcribed on the day prior, or actually on the day of the actual uh, launch and official opening of Tong San Tide in 1989. So it's a moment in which, you know, uh, his work was is probably his most critical work, his most um, debated work, the work with which he really became known uh, nationally, internationally, was first unveiled. And it, uh, you can tell that there's a lot of emotion in his, you know, going across his mind and uh, both being very proud as well as being very energetic as well as being very anxious, I think, uh, about the outcome. And he speaks very clearly about the fact that he's, you know, was so concentrated, he was so determined to finish this project. And he was so concentrated in the making of it that he all of a sudden realized that probably could have misspelled the name of collaborators or like, you know, he didn't really pay too much attention to all, each one individual as he wanted to, just because he really wanted to go and uh, public with it. And there's something really special about the, the liveliness of his conversation uh, with a friend and uh, to a degree a mentor. And there's a frankness, and there's an openness in the conversation, uh, which is to some, you know, in some points it's quite assertive, it's quite confident, but in many other points I think it, it, it has doubts and uh, moment of like an almost candor and weakness, which I think are very, very beautiful. But within that, you know, there are so many important political statements through that uh, convo, which is, I thought was worth revisiting and republishing and re-edit a little bit. Conversely, for Jimmy, it was quite the opposite. Jimmy was not talking. He was really not a big talker. He was a very shy person. He did not write, you know, his, um, or talk to his mind very often. And, but he was quite talkative with a, a selected number of friends, particularly, you know, the handful that have been really following him at the mis most important moments of his life. And I was lucky enough to, to manage to get in touch with at least three of them, obviously Laurie Simmons, who has been gracefully facilitating the project. But most importantly, I think, because their voices hadn't been heard yet with the, uh, um, Stefanotti, who had been a mentor, Pygmalion, gallerist, uh, lover, friend, model, you name it. It had been like in a very strong presence for Jimmy, who for the first time, as far as I know, speaks a length about his relationship to, uh, to Jimmy in a way that, again, is very you know, candid, is very open, is very frank, uh, is very loving, is very caring, but also critical, you know, also analytical. And it really brings back to life that time moment, particularly through the lens of contemporary art, through the lens of, of, uh, of, of a dealer, of a, of a gallerist who was amongst the first to believe that photography could become a medium uh, accepted by, uh, by the art world. And, um, he also kind of makes a lot of relationships. Well, I mean, I did invite him to a degree to start speaking about um, Jimmy's relations to Robert Mapperthorpe, for example, Sam Valkstuff, and many other people of, uh, of who were, you know, whom with Jimmy had a, a love and hate relationship, I think, at the time. And then I also had the opportunity to speak to Diego Cortes, who was, again, initially a lover. Uh, Jimmy's lover when he moved to New York to start with. Uh, and Diego Cortes is, is probably little known outside of the US, but it was, I think, one of the most uh, um, creative mind in the field of curation in New York, 
through the 70s until the present. And there's something incredibly saddening that it has occurred because he died of uh, COVID related complications um, uh, recently. And well, just before the publication of the book, and uh, I managed to send him uh, the draft of the final, well, the final draft of the text, and he sent me his own amend. And he, he told me something like, you know, I'm in my hospital bed. Uh, I can't really read much, uh, particularly on my phone, but I trust you've done a good work. And, um, and I don't know whether I did, but in, in a sense, it felt like a final blessing for the publication. So when the book came out, I was over the moon just because he felt that it was my last little tribute to him as well who obviously i wasn't even expecting that he would have passed away so soon and for such uh a such reason um and even through his word i think jimmy comes to life in a way that it has never before just because there has been no official biography being written he was not you know a biographer of himself the only thing that he left is his work and the memory of him in the mind and the heart of a few selected ones. And so I think that the book does two things. I mean, I hope that the book does two things. The first one in the case of Jim is to really bring back to life uh, him as a person as well as an artist uh, in a way that hasn't done before. And this is thanks to the people that, who contributed in different way. And I think on, 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 on our end, we really tried a, a critical analysis of a work that, you know, uh, across all of the different time period that probably hasn't been done so exhaustively uh, previously. So um, I'm, I'm, I really do hope that we have contributed for, uh, to the uh, uh, implementation of a knowledge that we have in relationship to Jimmy DeSana as an artist and uh, on his work. And for Marlon, I think we also did something quite interesting. We did systematize all of his filmography, and I think we managed, you know, quite succinctly to describe the work accurately for anyone to have a grasp of what his filmography is about and to get curious enough to go and look at the work for themselves. I think particularly thanks to Robert, um, we also tried to uh, create a little bit of a kind of cultural uh, framework uh, for his presence and for his role within uh, the black gay community in, in America at the time, but also beyond that, I think. Um, and also to give him voice again and so to allow for him to speak again uh, in a way that I hope uh, reach out the younger generations and those that they haven't been able to listen to his words um, at the time and um, and in a way to reinforce the, the importance uh, of his work in contemporary society in this moment in this juncture so not only to memori memorialize it as a document of the past, but as an evidence of the presence. And I think that's really uh, what the book was hoping to do as well. And then we haven't really spoken much about the relationship that both of them had with Vancouver and Canada, which is how all of these came together. And I, uh, and I think it's worth saying a few words about that. Um, at the time you did invite me initially, I didn't know that both of them had some form of relations to Vancouver, which in retrospect is no surprise because both of them, I mean, one from the East Coast and the other one from the West Coast, Vancouver was at the time really well connected with both sides of the Atlantic in the, in the US, both through artistic channels as well through channels of, of political activism. And I think there's one event in particular in 1990, which it becomes the opportunity for Vancouver to become an international platform for LGBTI communities uh, uh, um, throughout America and probably, you know, internationally, which was the organization of the Gay Games, uh, which for the first time took place outside of San Francisco. And I think the incredible violence with which the gay games were welcomed by conservatives in Canada 
really offered an opportunity for both the local community as well as the international community to mobilize and to become even stronger and even louder at the time where at the ethics of a pandemic where these voices want you know wanted to be silenced by political uh, uh, powers across you know the border both in Canada as well as in the US and so in a sense although probably neither Jimmy nor Marlon they were necessarily interested in the games per se uh, they really became even more connected with the games because that was at that moment an international platform where issues and concerns that they were uh, important to both of them they became more visible through the organization of the games and it became even more important to become visible particularly through the healthy body of an athlete uh, in a, a, a moment, at the moment in time in which the, the gay boy body particularly was associated only with the disease and with sickness. And so there are many, many reasons why I think these two authors that happened to become connected to Vancouver at that moment, because at that moment, Vancouver was a very important platform for uh, queer emancipation and visibility with all of the imperfections that surely the event had at the time. I mean, I'm, it would be too long to discuss about the, you know, the, the politics of the event, but you know, one of the main accusations was that the gay games, they were basically uh, reducing uh, the entire community to the white, you know, gay, healthy looking, handsome men, which obviously it was not inclusive of all of the different declinations of queerness. Um, and yet, you know, it was a, a very, it was a loudspeaker, it was a platform, it was a stage, it was an opportunity. Um, and I think it was also very important that it was Vancouver because for a long period of time, Vancouver was associated with the so-called patient zero, which eventually we understood that it was patient O. Uh, which changes completely the narrative and we, again we can talk about this for a very long time but just to summarize the, the story there had been this uh, understanding that uh, the patient O which was an outsider so O stand, you know, was standing originally from outside the locality uh, as a Canadian was believed to be the patient zero, that means the beginning of all of the pandemic and the, basically the beginning of the, of the crisis, uh, was a man who was born in Montreal, but uh, who died, well actually lived for a long period of time and then eventually, uh, until almost the end of his life, lived in Vancouver. So there's also this idea that uh, Vancouver for a period of time became somehow symbolically or allegorically the epicenter of the uh, HIV AIDS pandemic. Uh, I think made probably the work of these two artists, although they were coming from America, resonating even louder because of the, of the story behind it. Um, and so the title then, I think also we might want to say two words about the title and I was a little bit ambivalent about using it, utilizing it because Obviously, the sodomite invasion, you know, if you read it immediately, you don't know what to think about it. I mean, you, you can feel there is something very strong, but I, you know, I take it now as almost like a, a, an act of pride. I mean, I'm very excited about the idea that there could have been a sodomite invasion as, a, as an affirmation, as a statement, as like, you know, a political act of visibility. But obviously, it was a quote uh, which was coming from the other side, from the conservative, who felt that the the gay games, the third gay games in 1990 in Vancouver was actually an invasion of sodomite into the city and therefore they were obviously averse in it and contrasting it with in, with, uh, uh, in any way they could. And um, this also became uh, the uh, title of a literary review which was published in Vancouver for only a couple of years. And uh, when I saw the uh, the the magazine, um, I thought there was very very strong this idea of that you know an entire community community of sodomites could take over a city and transform it. I thought it was like, oh my god, this is such an interesting radical act. I think I really want to utilize this um, this title as a way to show 
uh, how something that it was meant to be as an offense could become an act of affirmation and, and self care and love. And so I thought that it was probably the time to revert the reading and the narrative and just to make it as a, as a positive connotation as opposed to a negative one or as an offense. Yes, and it speaks across, in a way it's a template for the book because the book does the same thing. You keep speaking across histories, you know, as mm. you're in the archive, as you brought the archive in of, of uh, Marlon's planned visit that was through Vivo, now titled Vivo, um, it had been planned for 1994 for him to actually come to Vancouver and do some work. Um, yeah, exactly. And, you know, so I, I think that title is just such a prompt for that sort of, um, you know, speaking both within history and outside history, showing this kind of labile form of political resistance over time. So I think it just, it's so succinct in the way that it does that. Um, yep there was the the intention but um but i also thought that it was you know it's kind of funny so someone told me actually i think it was artist dora garcia she said like you know i actually love the word sodomites it just simply is not used anymore and i was like you know what i actually really like it myself because you know it's a biblical word it in a sense it's like it simply is a geographical affirmation it's like you know someone from Sodoma <laughs> that's as simple as it is but then all of the connotation that he gets about all of the sin and like you know it's I think like you know this is really time to be sodomites and just to be happy about it actually <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, um, I know that there's so much more we could say um I don't know if there's anything more you want to add. There, were, I have so many questions that we didn't get to, but um, I recognize there's so many. But one thing I would just say is something that I thought was really powerful is um, uh, in um, the interview with Marlon Riggs, he talks about it. There's, there's this conversation about a multiplicity of voices and this kind of collective diaristic impulse that comes through. and. Mm. and and he's talking about the fact that his voice becomes this narrative thread through the films as a holding zone for all of the multiple voices that he is hoping to kind of gather together in yeah. collectively. And I thought, you know, it's interesting because Jimmy DeSanta also called on his friends, his lovers to be part of those who were photographed. And so both seem to create these ensemble pieces in a way like, that they both have these kind of, um, you know that, that they hold a community even formally in the way that they're working that are that is quite intimate and personal and collective and i um and and martin riggs talks about demonstrating the beauty of the group and i thought that was just such a beautiful way to speak about care formally in this working together um and i just wondered if that had also kind of been part of your organizing of this book as an editor thinking about all of the voices that you called together, like even what you talked about. Yeah, for sure. I think it would have been impossible for me to, to, to write a book as a, as a single voice because, well, for, for many reasons. First of all, because the, um, the time period that we are looking at is so incredibly complex. Also, we are looking at, you know, different geographies, different biographies, different cultural background. Uh, different life experiences. Um, and I felt, com you know, from the outset, completely inadequate to, to, to narrate that in the first person only, you know, it had to be uh, a choral conversation. And I think, you know, you're correct in saying that, particularly Marlon, he really choreographed uh, a multiplicity of voices, particularly at the moment in which he realized that he was not alone in his struggle. So he really had this um, intuition that as a cinematographer, but also as a documentarist, he had to record the voices of the people around him who were dying. And he had to give them an opportunity to speak for themselves. You know, similarly to Jimmy, I say at some point in the book that, you know, you can always recognize a Jimmy's photograph. You know, it doesn't matter who collaborates, who does whatever, is always an expression of his will. 
And I think the same could be said about Marlon. So you can always recognize that it's Marlon's work. But the way in which it does allow, it creates space and it does allow for this multiplicity of voices to emerge is uniquely his own, but is also incredibly generous and open and welcoming as a space. And in that sense, that's probably the greatest in indication of his talent and artistry, you know, and, um, and his political value to this day, just to have enabled a generation, or at least the generation that it was close to him, uh, to become visible just before they became invisible again, for reasons very different from the one uh, which were banishing them uh, earlier. And in, in that sense, the idea of social responsibility, I mean, at the time, the simple fact to be alive or to stay alive or to stay as much as alive as it could was in itself a political act. And both of them understood that. And both of them, they worked until the last breath because they understood the power of that act of defiance, in a sense. With maybe the difference that as time progressed, Jimmy became even more introvert. I mean, I said over and over again that he was not, you know, quite a shy person. And I think when he got sicker, he became even more reclusive. And conversely, because of the nature of the work, but also because of his personality, it was very gregarious. Marlon surrounded himself with more and more people. Actually, it didn't look like, you know, it couldn't let go. And so it had more and more people involved, almost because he wanted more witness around him of his life, of his presence. And it couldn't recede in, 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 in the background. And he stayed in the limelight until, you know, the last moment. And I think Jimmy didn't have the same. I mean, he had the will to continue to work and he worked until the very last minute. But he didn't want, I think, by the end to be, to be on the limelight. And he never did. You know, if you think about like, you know, all of his friends, all of his lovers, everyone knew that he was always taking pictures and he was hiding continuously behind the camera. And yet, you know, it was everywhere, but nowhere because nobody could actually see him or nobody really spoke to him. And so it's very interesting how these completely different personalities, they, um, they embrace and they face similar circumstances, but really showing completely different colors in, in terms of the way they reacted to these things. And yet with the same passion and love and dedication to the work and to the mission in a sense, because I think both work, uh, for both artists, their work became a mission and a political uh, statement, a final political statement, and their legacy in many ways. And the humor in Jimmy DeSanto's work. Of ever. course. But, you know, the same is with Marlon. I mean, like, you know, this entire section dedicated to the snap. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's hysterical. It's super funny. It's like, you know, strong is political, but it also had, you know, this incredible uh, snap, you know, uh, uh, a presence, a sharpness, and uh, a humor, which is very comparable to the one by Jimmy, actually. Well, there's so much more to say. I don't know if there's anything that you, else that you want to comment on that we didn't, that we don't. Um, I wanted just to really to, to thank you and to thank everyone at the Griffin, but also all of our collaborators. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful for like the support given to all of the contributors, obviously, to the book. Uh, we didn't mention Lyle Ashton Harris, who had been generous enough to give us uh, some beautiful photographs uh, taken by of Marlon as he was alive, as they were collaborators. and. And uh, Lila has been assistant photographer in his last film as well. So obviously uh, many stories there. And I think the exhibition and the book, they became more precious thanks to his uh, uh, artistic contribution, but also his memories and uh, his love and, and care. Um, I'm also very much in depth to Vivo. You mentioned it earlier, the idea that uh, a lot of documentation, particularly in relationship to Marlon's uh, uh, presentations in, uh, in Vancouver, Marlon's work uh, presentations in Vancouver was connected to them and to the video exchange uh, system that they had at the time. Um, uh, A.A. Bronson, who was really very supportive, particularly at the beginning of the project, and who highlighted the connection that Jimmy DeSana had. 
uh, with some of the artists in, in Vancouver and um, and the Cinematheque, because I think that the screenings at the Cinematheque, they were incredibly important, not only because historically uh, Cinematheque had been the venue where Marlon's work had been presented in the past. Um, uh, the memorial they did in 94 really is, uh, is an important uh, piece of history, I think, for the cultural life in Vancouver and a milestone for the commemoration of um, Marlon Riggs. So the idea to have collaborated with them again uh, in this occasion, it was super important. And also it's probably worth saying that in uh, at the time we were working on this project, it was the 30th anniversary of Tongs and Tide, which I think is still one of the most important artworks and films and documentary of the 80s, of the late 80s. And so there was also a special occasion for 2019 to be the time in which we wanted to represent and revisit and, and rethink about the, the uh, Marlon's legacy. And endless thanks to Vivian and Lori who had been hosting me and opened the entire archive and allowed me to look at Jimmy's work in ways uh, in which would have been impossible without her support and collaboration and, and love and care. So I think, yeah, that's more about thanking people than saying more. <laughs> I'm going to just show the work because we haven't even looked at it, but I know we've been, we're doing things the other way around, <laughs> but that's the book. That's the baby. <laughs> we did it. And, and obviously, thank you guys. You, you, you did all of the, you know, the final work, the printing and everything. It's another act of care, uh, which is twice as valuable because was made remotely with the, uh, all of the possible difficulties one can imagine plus the distance so <laughs> you know and i'm so excited that there's a record of the exhibition and you know in mm. some ways um because of the 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 way that things unfolded that year we were able to have the resources to actually have a record of the exhibition and and uh and so that it lives on i mean we know how consequential this work is and so yeah. um you know i just want to congratulate you on, on producing this beautiful book and I think it'll be consequential in years to come. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughtful thank you. editorial thank work, you. thoughtful editorial work, um, and for unpacking it a little bit here today. And I think it's incredibly timely, and the urgency is only made you know more apparent as we know. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, we all say like you know, the history is repeating. But as a matter of fact. Um, I think what this the evocation of that time period and then that context, I think it shows two things that there are still ramification of that period today, and you know there are st there's still so much work to be done, uh, also in relationship to the stigma uh, associated with HIV and AIDS. But I think in terms of like you know literally of uh, uh, social emancip emancipation and social justice, etc. I mean, all of these themes are still incredibly current. But the other thing that it, it shows, which we touch up on earlier, is just this idea that there is nothing that we conquer that it stays forever. So in a sense, it really is an invite to the younger generation to, to stay alert and to be fully aware that whichever thing we have conquered over time has to be defended daily. And I think this is something that we started to realize at that moment in time. It's like you know, there's no social political achievement that has stays there forever indelibly. It has to be defended every day. And I think that's probably something that it became even more important, more relevant and more obvious to me as we were progressing with uh, both the pandemic as well as the publishing of the book. And so that's probably the, the, the final message uh, of the book itself. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we are going to get this book into hands and libraries. That's our next mission. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for being here on the end of your very busy travel day, um, London. 
sorry, tuning in from Italy. I don't know exactly which town. Are you in Bologna or? Yeah, I'm in Siena. Just came back to my hometown to visit family, and uh, it's eleven fifteen at night. So wow. I think it's time for me to have a, a glass of wine and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds perfect. Thank you again so very much. For Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you everyone for joining us here today for the lunch. A reminder that we have a special offer for you throughout the week. If you want to purchase the book, you'll get a 10% discount and free shipping. You can do this by filling out the form that I'm putting in the chat right now. And uh, if you would like to know more about Griffin and stay in touch, you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of our website. Thank you so much, everyone.